Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, May 22nd. Upheaval at today's Chicago School Board meeting. President Frank Clark and the rest of the board stepped down. Now Mayor Lightfoot says a new team will be in place very soon. It's only her third day in office, but Lightfoot doesn't have time to waste when it comes to city finances. How can Chicago address its fiscal troubles? Stopping it isn't just in the city's interest, it's in the city council's interest. And the mayor issues a stern warning to city council members in her inaugural address. How did that go over? We tackle that and more in our weekly Spotlight Politics. Cannabis is a trial and error kind of medicine. Marijuana is a psychoactive drug, but is it really a medicine? This is a show about how we are always many things at once. A new exhibition surveys 50 years of queer art. And how did this Lincoln Park statue wind up standing in cities all over the world? Find out in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. All of that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Paris Schutz. An armed man was shot dead by Chicago police this morning. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Paris, Chicago police were called to a home in Woodlawn this morning by the man's father, who said his bipolar son had a gun. The CPD says crisis intervention officers were negotiating with him when he began shooting and the SWAT team was called. As CPD describes it, an armed encounter ensued during which the police shot the man. The 22-year-old later died at nearby University of Chicago Hospital. The Cook County Medical Examiner's Office has identified him as Miles Frazier. It comes after just this morning, Chicago police promoted new virtual training technology they'll use to help train officers on how to deal with individuals with mental illness and other special needs. Users wear headgear that shows computer simulated scenarios police may encounter. Sir, how you doing? What's going on? Me by the car. Me by the car. My name's Officer Davis. This is my partner, Officer Taylor. We got a call from the store owner. Me by the car. Me by the car. In this scenario, police were called to deal with a shoplifter who turn, turns out to have been a man with autism. Officers learn to ask to approach shoppers to steer clear. They turn off the squad car's lights and sirens and send someone to find the man's parents. Crisis intervention training is mandatory under the new consent decree governing Chicago police. Chicago area residents concerned about what they see as loopholes in Illinois gun laws rallied at the Capitol today. They say weaknesses in the law were exposed by the deadly shooting in Aurora this past February. The shooter was able to get a firearm owner's identification or FOID card despite a felony record that should have prevented it. Activists are calling on legislators to require stronger background checks, requiring fingerprinting for anyone applying to own a gun, and stronger enforcement of gun revocations. But gun rights groups say the changes before the Illinois House are overly burdensome and so expensive, it would mean gun owners who can't afford higher application fees would be unfairly classified as criminals. As for the weather, showers and thunderstorms overnight with a low around 62. Some of those storms could get severe. Then tomorrow, a slight chance of showers, otherwise sunny with a high near 76. And now, Paris, back to you. Thanks, Amanda. In a dramatic move, the entire Chicago School Board steps down. This on a day that teachers are rallying in advance of negotiating a new contract with the new mayor. That rally has been going on in the loop. It's just now wrapping up, and that is where we find Brandis Friedman with more on a day of big events. And I'm, I'm being told now that we have lost a signal with Brandis Friedman, so we'll try and get that back later in the show. Uh, but in lieu of that, we will go to Carol Marine and another challenge facing the new mayor, and that is all of the problems on the fiscal front. Carol. Thank you. The baton is officially out of Rahm Emanuel's hands and now in Mayor Lori Lightfoot's possession. But even with Emanuel out the door, there is at least one thing here to stay, and that is the city's troubling finances. Those fiscal woes include, just for starters, a now projected $740 million budget deficit, which is already being questioned about whether it's even a figure way too low. And then, of course, there are massive unfunded pension liabilities 
possibilities and the fear among citizens that all of this translates into an even more onerous tax burden for them. What are the new mayor's options, or rather, very hard choices? Joining us to discuss their thoughts on all of this, Lawrence Massal, he is president of the Civic Federation. Michael Belsky, executive director of the Center for Municipal Finance at the University of Chicago's Harris School of Public Policy. Amanda Cass, associate director of the Government Finance Research Center at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Ed Bacharach, founder and president of the Center for Pension Integrity. Welcome all of you back to Thank Chicago you. tonight. So Lawrence, is $740 million in a budget deficit in fact too conservative a figure? I don't think it's too conservative, but I don't think that it's gonna be the final number. I think now that mayor-elect, or now Mayor Lightfoot takes office and brings her financial team, they're going to see that there are things that weren't necessarily disclosed. The number will probably go up. This, the 750 is the project, I'm sorry, 730 million was what Carol, um, Carol Brown. Brown, the former CFO for Mayor Emanuel, had projected it at. Mayor, Eman mayor Lightfoot is going to have some of her own priorities. But that is really looking at the very short term. That's the deficit that they project just to get to the budget in November. Michael Belsky, is that number in the ballpark or not? Well, when you take into account the other liabilities besides just the operating budget, um, you know, that's, that, that is a possibility to be that high. Um, you know, normally they're talking about 300 million when you take into account the other liabilities that it inflates that number. Amanda, why aren't there just hard and fast there's the number right here in, you know, in the ledger. Why don't we know the exact number? Well, I think part of this is a reflection of kind of public finance uh, in general, and that's that things are kind of constantly in flux. So the second you pin down one number, uh, assets, liabilities, everything can kind of change. For uh, the general public, it's hard to understand right now because there's no documents out there that have the most up-to-date financial data in them. So for example, the pension systems, the data that I have is as of the end of fiscal year 2017. Um, and so, wait, wait, wait. so why, why aren't the documents out there? I mean, why are we that far behind? Well, part of it is because of when the official documents get published by the pension systems. Um, and this is one of the areas where I think Mayor Lightfoot could improve things about bringing more transparency, more communication about the city's finances to the general public. Ed Beckerick, what's your number? Uh, I, I hear all these numbers. Uh, the big uh, flaw that I see is that uh, unlike other cities, Chicago doesn't use generally accepted accounting principles. Why not? Uh, you tell me. Uh, but uh, if New York City, when they went through, broke in 1975, went through their whole reorganization, that was part of their city charter. So they have to use GAAP for their financial statements. So. Uh, I agree with everybody on the panel here. Uh, I hear the numbers, uh, but it's moving all over the place. And so you have a public that is, I think, somewhat befuddled and not very trusting because you as experts can't even say, well, here's, here's that number that you're looking for. And so what are they supposed to, to make of this in terms of solving our fiscal crisis? And whom do they trust? So part of the problem is that the, the city and the politicians and the elected officials are really focused on the budget. The budget is not the same thing as the financial statements. So the financial statements, which they publish late because they wait for the audited financial statements, are not available generally for that year when they're doing the budget. So it's somewhat of a timing. The public is weary of the fact that we can't settle not only on what the budget deficit is, but what is going to be the source of that funding to close that. I think Mayor Emanuel had some success going to Springfield to try to stabilize city finances, to try to increase the amount of money that was going into the pensions. But all that really resulted in was more taxes for Chicagoans. It bought some time, but the city is in deep financial trouble. So what can the city council do all what? by itself without talking about Springfield? Well, I think the, I think the city uh, itself uh, has to look at ways to do things more efficiently. And I, I had just recently written about outcome-based budgeting. Uh, we start with the base budget every year, and we never question what's in it. So the new mayor has an opportunity to point up 
what are her objectives, so if it's safe neighborhoods, how do you measure that? So you look at things like, is there a reduction in property crime? Is there a reduction in violent crime? How do people perceive safety? And then you, you take the outcome and you try to get uh, agencies working together and you only keep those that can be measured and are effective. And that way you take out some of the, the programs that have been in the base for years and have never been questioned. To the public that might sound like let's form a commission, which is something that happens with every new administration. Right. Do we have time for that? Well, I, I mean, I would say this, that the city of Baltimore has done this under three mayors successfully. Amanda? I think a big lift and in, in a first step, again, is really communicating to the general public about the city's finances and the budget. I think the city's finances are incredibly complex. It takes a lot of effort for me, who, who does this all day, every day, to understand it. And so I would encourage the new mayor to really think about how do you make this accessible to your average Chicago resident so they understand these numbers. The second thing I think is that the city council has a, an office of financial analysis and I did also encourage her to think about boosting that office so that it can function like a congressional budget office for the city of Chicago and do really robust in-depth analysis of any kind of ordinances that are being proposed. And I know you've studied other cities in Los Angeles as an yes. example. Mm -hmm. um, far bigger and yet? Yes, so Los Angeles is more than twice the land area of Chicago, has 45 percent more people, and yet it spends about the same number of dollars for fire and police departments. So if we had just parity with Los Angeles, we'd save $650 million a year in Chicago. Is that an adequate comparison? Aren't we different culturally and in other ways? I mean, is, can you just put a kind of of transparency on top and say we could be Los well, Angeles? Well, uh, let's look at the police department. Uh, even though we spend the same number of dollars, uh, we have twice as many policemen, patrolmen per capita as Los Angeles. Twenty years ago in the aftermath of Rodney King, it was the worst police department in the nation and now it's one of the best. Our combined, our homicide rate in 2016 was five times the combined rate of New York and Los Angeles. So better management and seriously looking at what other people are doing is what the city has to do. It may require a commission. Uh, it should be broad-based. The council should look at it. Lawrence, Rahm Emanuel is a smart man and he had eight years and he had the advice in various forms of all of you and so many more. Why couldn't he solve it? Well, I think there's a lot to be learned from that. It is the fact that he went after the pension issue primarily because that's what's driving the city's finances because it has such large unfunded liabilities. But he couldn't do anything on his own without the Illinois General Assembly and the governor approving it. The state created the city's pension funds. When you talk about comparisons, there's no comparison between Illinois and Chicago and the number of pension funds we have and compared to states around the country. Just across the border in Wisconsin, they have one major public employee pension fund. We have over 600. So what, what would we save, for instance, if we consolidated 600 public pensions? You have the potential to save hundreds of millions of dollars. More importantly, you have the ability to improve oversight, improve management of it. There is no justification for having so many separate repetitive outlets providing the basic the same service. I want to get to one thing that that um, that Ed said. Chicago needs to wake up. We have been doing the same thing for a long time. It's the Chicago way. That's why we have so many units of government. That's why we have so many pension funds. This new mayor has an opportunity to really to change the way Chicago delivers services to the benefit of the taxpayers, not to the institutions, not to the uh, elected officials. You ask what the city council can do? The city council can do a lot, they, but primarily they could start paying more attention to the budget, pay more attention to the finances instead of serving as another 311 center. Lori Lightfoot is not Mike Madigan and she is not the Democratic supermajorities of either house. So in point of fact, is, is can she have success unless the legislature arrives at her door and says we're with you? I, I mean I think it's going to be very difficult. The, the Civic Federation has been writing for years about the fact that we have revenues we're not tapping in the city in our tax base. It's not broad enough. We have a, a regressive sales tax. We need a mix of revenues. You can't rely on one or the other and this this mounting uh, liability is not going to go away. 
Uh, she needs to be honest with the people that this is going to take X number of dollars a year and there's only so much you can take out of the cost of government so we need new revenue sources and Springfield needs to recognize that Chicago is a major driver of the state and without new revenue sources the major driver of the state's going to fail. New revenue sources that means taxes is that correct? And so what new revenue sources Ed? Uh, you've got a lot of different revenue sources but the the, the key revenue source that it's probably going to boil down to is property taxes. The property is not going anywhere and everybody tries to avoid it and they come up with other fees but the other fees always end up being more regressive. Uh, a property tax is the most progressive. But once again, if, if you're going to be catching up on some of this funding, you know, to catch up the pensions it's going to require $170 billion over the next 40 years. So if people that aren't even born are going to be paying off the liability that we have right now, you better give them something in return for it. Otherwise, why are they going to stick around? Amanda, what untapped revenues could you identify for us quickly that Lori Lightfoot could pass fast? Uh, I mean, if I'm going to be totally clear and honest, none. Uh, I think the city's in a difficult position in that it is reliant on Springfield to generate <laughs> substantial revenue that's not regressive. So if we're looking at uh, income tax revenue or expansion of the sales tax, that's both going to require action by the General Assembly. Unfortunately, I think the, the kind of biggest revenue bite there is, is the property tax levy. Um, and but I it's driving people, if we, if we believe the published reports, it's driving people out of Illinois and sending them someplace else. Right, but I mean, it's the hardest, it's by far the hardest tax to pay because it's not correlated to your income. And, um, you know, there are other states, and again, I point to the Civic Federation, that are taxing uh, personal services. We tax goods. Retirement the income, there is another one. I think Lori but has to, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Mayor um, Lightfoot has to you better develop, not be that a, familiar <clears throat> right, develop a partnership <laughs> with Governor Pritzker to basically work on this issue. The city's finances are directly tied to what the state of Illinois has done and created in terms of pensions. If the state goes forward with its graduated income tax proposal, a majority of that revenue is going to come from the city of Chicago tax taxpayers. And if everyone is concerned, and I believe it's a very valid concern, and people are always contacting us and talking about the burdens of the property tax, the only way that you're going to reduce the property tax burden is to stabilize the local governments and share the revenue. Right now, this, for the last 10 years, the state of Illinois has been reducing the amount of money it shares with local governments. So I just would, just a very quick yes or no, is Pritzker going to pass in this session his graduated income tax ed? Yes or no? I don't know. <laughs> you don't, you I, prediction, I, I, no? I, I can't predict. Amanda? Mm -hmm. Maybe, but then it'll be on to the voters in 2020. Mike? I think it will get through the legislature. Lawrence? I think he will get a vote that will pass the General Assembly that will allow for the um, putting on the ballot, the graduated income tax, but it's not necessarily the final um, proposal. They have a whole nother year before 2020, November of 2020, when they vote on it. I know, but you've got to get this through the legislature. You've got to get it to the right. voters. You've got to bring it back to the legislature. Right. There isn't a, right. that's a lot of time. I would point to the other bigger question, which is the General Assembly may approve it. Will the public support it if it doesn't, isn't proving to stabilize the state and city finances? Well, we right. didn't solve this, did we? Lawrence Massal, <laughs> Michael Belsky, Amanda Cass, and Ed Bagrack, thank you very much Thanks. for being with us. Thanks, Gary. More ahead. Stay with us. Good to see you guys. Still come on Chicago tonight. Mayor Lightfoot versus the council machine. That and more in our weekly edition of Spotlight Politics. For Stonewall's 50th anniversary, a new art exhibition aims to change our ideas about gay liberation and queerness. And Jeffrey Bayer puts his history stuff to the test at a spot for summertime fun in Ask Jeffrey. But first, as we mentioned earlier, Brandis Friedman has been following the developments with the Chicago School Board today. 
Earlier, Lori Lightfoot, the mayor, announced that all school board members, including the chairman, Frank Clark, have stepped down. This amid a rally held by the Chicago Teachers Union that just wrapped up in the loop about an hour ago. And that is where Brandis Friedman joins us now. Brandis. Paris, you're right. I'm uh, at the Thompson Center where that rally did wrap up about a half hour ago or, or so. And as you said, all of the sitting CPS board members announced during a regularly scheduled Chicago Public School Board meeting this morning that they would be stepping down from the board. Um, I'm told by a CPS source that all of them received a phone call last night from someone in the mayor's office letting them know that today would be their last day as board members. Now, Mayor Lightfoot, in a statement, she said that she ran on a platform of delivering bold reforms in the education system and quote that that promise begins by putting equity first, expanding early childhood education, supporting our dedicated teachers and staff and ensuring that those decisions made on behalf of our children are led by those with different perspectives throughout the district, including CPS parents, educators, administrators and LSC members. That statement, uh, Paris goes on to thank those board members for their service. We're told by the mayor's office that she expects to name uh, new board members in the coming days and that they will all be seated in time for the next school board meeting, which happens in late June. Now, I'm joined by the newly reelected CTU president, Jesse Sharkey. Um, Jesse, what's your reaction to the changes at the school board today? Well, I mean, it underscores, Brandis, the degree to which the board serves as the pleasure of the mayor. And then it really it's the mayor that calls the shots in the schools of Chicago. And then until we get an elected school board, it's going to remain that way. So, so the fate of the schools and what's happening in the next teacher's contract, for example, really rests in the hands of the mayor. What does this mean for your hopes for an elected school board? Well, the Mayor Lightfoot has, um, you know, run or, or sort of campaigned on a set of promises to deliver um, needed changes in the schools. Um, what she talked about, she's talked about basic educational supports, for example, uh, counselors, a nurse every day. Currently in Chicago public schools, we only have like a nurse one day a week in most elementary schools. Um, uh, wraparound supports for students dealing with trauma. Those are all things that are, are, are much needed, and um, you know we, we hope the mayor uh, follows through on those uh, because we're in the contract negotiations, and that will be a place to codify and to agree to those things in writing. Now, today's rally, which just wrapped up, you had several hundred uh, teachers here, did a march around City Hall. You all are calling on Lori Lightfoot to keep those promises that you just referred to that she ran on in her campaign. Um, what do you expect going forward with the new mayor, and what is your relationship like so far? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, it's a breath of fresh air to have a mayor who's saying we need to deliver really high quality schools in every one of our neighborhoods uh, and, 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 and sort of making those uh, representations in public and those promises. That's great. Um, now, the hard part is going to be actually delivering on those things, you know, because the. the Hold back or lose. Well, that was uh, Brandis Friedman with uh, CTU President Jesse Sharkey. It appears that we've lost the transmission to that. They were in the loop uh, today. As Brandis reported, the school board members have all stepped down, the Chicago school board members, that is. And Lori Lightfoot, the mayor, says that she will be appointing new school board members in the coming days. Of course, Lightfoot has supported the idea of an elected school board. That's something that has to happen in Springfield. So it's unclear when she does appoint new school members how how long they would actually serve their terms. Uh, that was Brandis Friedman, the president of the Chicago Teachers Union, and that union is negotiating a new contract with the city. And now on to the subject of medical marijuana. Marijuana laws are changing rapidly, but as of now, adults can only use it recreationally in 10 states. That number more than triples, triples for so-called medical marijuana, and that's legal in 33 states. So which is it? Is it a pleasure drug or a pharmaceutical one? And what difference does it make when it comes to regulating cannabis? These are all questions to ponder as states like Illinois consider moving from a medical program to a more open-ended recreational one. Five local PBS stations around the country, including here at WTTW, are examining marijuana legalization in their communities. For our latest story in the series, Chicago Tonight's Amanda Vinicky explores the medical marijuana question. Chicago-based Cresco Labs grows some 30 strains of marijuana at its main cultivation center. While the marijuana leaf may be the unofficial international symbol for weed, that's not where the plant's power resides. So if you look closely at this flower part, you can see that it has a dusting or a frosting of trichomes. Um, those are little oil glands that do contain the cannabinoids. 
Those cannabinoids are the promise that Cresco seeks to harness and sell to patients in Illinois who are looking to marijuana to alleviate their symptoms. Patients like Adrian Aronson, a 78-year-old grandmother and artist who suffers from fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia is constant pain throughout your body. When those didn't do the trick, she followed her physician's advice to visit another doctor, a specialist in integrative medicine who somewhat unwittingly became an international expert in medical marijuana after Illinois' law passed in 2013. I knew nothing about this as a physician, and I read further into it, and I saw that the qualifying conditions described my medical practice. Fibromyalgia, people with cancer, multiple sclerosis. Dr. Temple says her waiting list ballooned since she became one of the doctors willing to certify that a patient has a qualifying condition. Though hesitant at first, Aronson says, weed is working. She says when she first visited Dr. Temple, on a scale of 1 to 10, her pain used to measure in 8. The last time I went to see her, she said, how do you feel? I said, I feel great. I feel fabulous. She takes her medicine religiously, a chunk of cannabis-laced candy she keeps tucked in the fridge every night. She says it helps her sleep, and a good night's sleep helps her with the pain. So you can see how big the stick is, and then I take off a little bite, maybe about so much. And each each stick is, let's see, there are four sticks, 100 milligrams, so there are 25 milligrams of THC, whatever that is. It may taste and look like candy, but Cresco's Nelson believes in the healing power of these pot gummies and the other products his company makes, the cannabis gel tablets, oils, and tinctures. There really are true medical benefits from- How does it work? Itself. What magic might these hoppily pungent leafy green plants hold in helping to stem nausea and seizures? Our body actually has an endogenous, our own homemade system that creates cannabis-like looking substances. The way cannabis works is it influences those systems in a way to either enhance one of those functions, to help us uh, forget pain, to get us to eat. Details on how, even whether marijuana does this are elusive. Because the federal government classifies cannabis as an illegal drug, researching it has been difficult. Northwestern medicine doctor Stephen Hanauer is going about it in a roundabout way. He's about a year into a study that's comparing Crohn's disease patients' personal evaluations of how they're feeling with blood and stool samples that can detect intestinal inflammation. The study isn't complete, but Hanauer has a hypothesis. My suspicion is that it makes the patients feel better, but it doesn't really change the disease activity. Making pain subside sounds great, but that isn't the same thing as a cure. We don't want the patient to be fooled and think that because their symptoms are controlled, they're out of the woods as far as the inflammation and the prognosis for the disease is concerned. It's not the miracle that many people will tout that it's a cure-all, and it's also not this evil vice that everyone should avoid. The truth is somewhere in the middle, and the truth is going to be different from person to person. Temple says it isn't as simple as writing a prescription for a pharmaceutical drug that's gone through the rigors of FDA testing. It's trial and error. That's precisely why Dr. Hanauer says marijuana is not a medicine. We don't know what dose patients should be using. We don't know what dose is going to be effective, and we don't know what dose is going to cause them harm. Illinois' medical marijuana program is still technically in the pilot stages, and it's tightly regulated. So much so that our cameras aren't allowed in dispensaries where products are sold. I'm concerned that the, the legitimizing of this as a medicine sends a message to the community that it's a it's a, a free-for-all, and let's, let's just use it willy-nilly. As for one of her patients, Adrienne Aronson's busy prepping for an art show. She's thankful she's virtually free from fibromyalgia pain, and she'll tell friends who ask. Yeah, I'm taking pot. I just love to be able to say that. <laughs> Should Illinois legalize marijuana for recreational use, Aronson's friends could take pot, too. Anyone 21 or older would be able to pop a cannabis candy or smoke a joint. In anticipation, Illinois-based marijuana companies have been growing, well, like weeds. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Amanda Vinicky.
Tomorrow we'll have part two of Amanda's look into medical marijuana, focusing on what will happen to Illinois' program if and when Illinois legalizes recreational pot. Well, Mary L Mayor Lightfoot is now into her third day on the job. This after issuing a stern warning to the folks sitting behind her at Monday's inauguration. Those, of course, would be the aldermen. Business as usual is over. So how did that play with them and what kind of start is Lightfoot off to? Joining us to tackle that and more is our spotlight political team of Amanda Vinicky and Carol Maureen. And Paris Shaw. Yes. It's great to see you. Uh, yeah, you, you and Amanda is straight, <laughs> straight from the marijuana dispensary. Uh, first, Carol, um, a mini controversy is brewing here over Lori Lightfoot, Mayor Lori Lightfoot's choice of security. What's going on here? Well, for the first time ever, uh, she has decided to bring in uh, a former U.S. Marshal with whom uh, she uh, worked when she was in the U.S. Attorney's Office and possibly some of his colleagues to supplement a Chicago Police Department detail and he, James Smith, who is uh, an owner of a, a private security firm, will be the commander of her operation. And uh, he has a connection to a, a very influential Illinois lobbyist, correct? He's married to Margaret Houlihan, who is uh, a, a lobbyist for United Airlines as well as AT&T. But the, one of the main questions, and it's more, uh, it's less about, there are a lot of power couples in Chicago, but the optics of not having a complete CPD detail when the citizens of Chicago rely only on CPD raises the question of whether they were insufficient for the mayor to feel completely well defended at a time when the police contract is a big jump ball. What about that, Amanda? Lori Lightfoot, Mayor Lightfoot, I have to get you saying Mayor Lightfoot, <laughs> um, already is somewhat at opposition with the police union. Does, uh, the, 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 does the optics of getting rid of uh, Chicago police security detail, replacing the, them with federal detail look bad? Oh, certainly I think it puts her in a difficult position. On one hand, she has those that believe she's too close to police, and then of course there's the fraternal order of police, the cops union, that are already at odds with her as well. She has basically said that all of this is much ado about nothing, a tempest in a teapot, she called it, basically an overreaction. And she has, is quoted as saying, the union is never happy. I'm not going to bend over backwards every time the FOP gets upset with something. That is certainly the sort of rhetoric that the union is not going to appreciate. Then again, that might be very much the rhetoric that got her elected, that people but, appreciate out of President Donald Trump. It's not going to make negotiating easy. But here's the problem with the tempest in a teapot. You can resolve a tempest if your press office is answering questions. The press office is not yet ready for prime time. And so I was one of the people, along with my colleagues at NBC, calling the press office and emailing the press office saying, what's the relationship? What's the U.S. Marshall deal about? Who does he answer to? Who, what payroll is he on? We still don't have very good answers to that. And yes. I would say you resolve a tempest by quickly, and to, to use the word that is regularly used by Lori Lightfoot and other candidates, transparency. And that, I think, could have been helped along. Credible. I mean, I just read, actually, the Chicago Tribune has an article about um, Mr. Smith's former part in authoring a recommendation to bring in the National Guard to Chicago to deal with crime. The entire article, Anel Ruiz, the spokesperson for Mayor Lightfoot, didn't respond. I mean, that's in that article five times. I know I have reached out via text, via email, to ask specific questions, have yeah. gotten nothing and that is really why actually do you think that is difficult. I mean are they are they are they just do they are they, they trying to hide from this no, or they just don't they're not really overwhelmed to deal with they may not be really up to speed um, uh, I got I finally did get an email back saying I'm sorry I've been slow to respond what are your questions again I put them out and I still didn't get answers so <clears throat> I think there is you can argue that Rahm Emanuel micromanaged his message and his press office was on top of you all the time, not always for the best, but this is the inverse or the obverse of that. What about the relationship between, uh, I mean, the husband and wife, one is a lobbyist, one is now the security director for Mayor Lightfoot. Um, is, should there be a firewall between those two jobs? I think those are questions to be asked. I mean, as I say, there are plenty of, uh, in government, powerful 
powerful couples that do different things, but you have to address it and say, this is how we address that kind of thing, because, because Mr. Smith's wife, Ms. Houlihan, is somebody who was testifying before city council with regard to certain considerations for the airlines. So, I mean, let's yeah, he, it's a he's conversation. He's not a policy advisor. It is certainly a conversation. He's not a policy advisor. I am. Don't. I think. Again, Mayor Lightfoot could heed this off by actually answering some questions because certainly there were people that were going to say, this is the least of Chicago's worries. We have actual crime to deal with beyond her security detail. This is early stages, but you need to have answers to those questions and have plans in place and be ready in anticipating that people are going to be asking these questions, which are fair to pose. One of the, one and, of the, go ahead, Carol. One, one of the other things is it's not just the police union. I've heard from rank and file, people who aren't madly in love with their police union who have been sort of stopped by the optics of it. And so it it isn't and it's politics, it's a game of optics. It is a game of optics. And if you are messaging well and succeeding in getting your message out, this is one of the things that has to be discussed. Speaking of optics, it was incredible optics on Monday when Mayor Lightfoot uh, scolds Alderman for business as usual and then looks at them and then Alderman Ed Burke is there in the back row with his wife, Supreme Court Justice Ann Burke, uh, clapping at uh, Mayor Lightfoot's um, admonition. Is this going to cause a rift uh, with between her and some of the old Garden City Council? It, even people who support her, and there are plenty of aldermen who do support her enthusiastically, were taken aback. They'll tell you that privately. They may not say it publicly. There are some, like Alderman Lopez, who on this very desk the other night said he was personally offended and he felt that she tarred all of them with the same corruption brush and he resented it. The question is, was, was there a way to say it without uh, turning and, and staring at them? I don't know, but you know, those are, those are the kinds of things that and we Amanda, wonder. immediately after she signed her executive order limiting aldermanic prerogative on licensing decisions and um, permitting decisions, does this executive order really end that practice? Not completely, because zoning is still not part of this. She says that she wants a total and complete overhaul of how the city deals with zoning, and of course that is a major part of things. Um, but certainly it, it, it does say that no, no longer can aldermanic, or can no longer can aldermen dictate what is or is not going to happen when it comes to things that should be fairly perfunctory. But department heads are going to have to come up with some kind of criteria or some kind of script that they read to aldermen when aldermen call them and say, hey, you know, let this, let this permit go through. Has well, an opinion. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I can just see a department head or two <laughs> saying, um, hello, Alderman, I'm not going to write this down right now, and yes, I, I hear your pain. I, it's, the devil is in, I hate this cliche, but in the details, and so how they implement it, what I've the protocols are. to come up with that. It'll, it'll take some time, but it's, it's a start. And it's certainly a message to aldermen as well. And right now, there will be plenty of people within City Hall that were appointed by previous mayors. But once she gets her people in there, and if they are believers in how she does business and in following this, yes, it's sending a message to aldermen. So it is both changing pr both procedure and her relationship with the City Council. It's also sending a message when she decides who gets to be committee chair and who does not get to be committee chair. What do you make of the fact that she expanded the number of committees when we've learned from our reporting and ProPublica's reporting that committees really waste a lot of money. They hire a lot of people that don't actually do committee work. Well, here's what I think. And the nuns taught me multiplication early <laughs> in my grammar school. So 18 committees, a chairman and a vice chair, that's 36 votes. And so if you're a little bit of cushion, gives ostensibly. you a little gives you a little bit of cushion and if she wants to put her finance chairs in, she's kept some of the old guard, she's put in some new people, and for Carrie Austin, who did not want to let go of her committee, she got she the budget um, committee. You've yes, got to find a place for people. That's what it is. It's making room for folks that they can feel as if they have a spot at the table when she is going to need their votes. That's what we're getting at. I will add that also other committees could, if you're going to take sort of an optimistic view of this, would say, all right, these are committees where she wants to put a priority. For example, an equity committee that is focused on something that she has an equity officer. It is certainly something she talked about a lot on the campaign trail. So it 
w we will see whether they actually well, have work to we, do. And whether the we need to learn what the these committees uh, are going to do because so many of these committees, they rarely ever meet. They, they never have a quorum. Right, and, and, and they have a certain, you know, bunch of revenue, which the aldermen who chair them count on to further so that'll be feathering what's their to nest. watch is the budgets for these committees I think more so than they'll probably the be reallocated the themselves. finance committee had a huge budget especially for personnel they when they moved the workers comp program out of finance committee they moved about 40 employees out of there too so you'd think maybe that gets redistributed and, and it may well and Scott Wagusback looks like he is on his way to being the finance chairman uh, Scott Wagusback knows um, in a granular way how these things operate, so there's some reason to be optimistic that he has a handle on this, though it's a big new job. Amanda, what do you make of the fact that many of the people that uh, Mayor Lightfoot has announced for her top positions are people from the Emanuel administration? We knew that she was going to keep, at least through the summer, Chicago Police Superintendent Eddie Johnson on the job. So that wasn't per se a surprise. That is, again, going to be something that we will look, how long will he remain in that post? Janice Jackson was something that she had not particularly been clear about. So that, to me, was the most significant, particularly as there are plenty of people who have been happy with the job that Janice Jackson has done, but others who say particularly what has gone on at CPS in terms of covering up sexual assault and sexual harassment, that that is a problem and so it's um it's it's a whole new world okay, well, but this not is... but i guess not all new all so right there we go. you you have brought us uh, a whole new world of Aww. political coverage and analysis but amanda vidicky carol marine we're out of time uh and thank you very much we'll see You're you next welcome. week okay well, 50 years ago next month, the Stonewall Riots in New York City started the modern gay rights movement, or at least they did in the popular imagination. A new exhibition at Lincoln Park's Wrightwood 659 challenges how we think of Stonewall's place in history, and it offers a comprehensive survey of 50 years of queer art. Chicago Tonight's Nick Blumberg has the story. The show, called About Face, Stonewall, Revolt, and New Queer Art, uses the 1969 uprising as less of a defining concept and more of a jumping off point. There is some contextual information about the Stonewall riots, but for the most part, Jonathan's vision uh, is about the nature of queerness and the nature of queerness in our society. Jonathan, in this case, is curator Jonathan David Katz, who directed the landmark 2016 show Art Aids America. Katz says this show challenges the notion that Stonewall marked a split between gay and straight. It's actually about getting rid of any kind of divide or split. This is a show about how we are always many things at once, and it elevates the idea of transness as the defining quality, hybridity, flux shift as the defining quality of the liberation movement. Another defining quality, political engagement and a refusal to stay quiet. The show features works challenging default binaries of male and female, gay and straight. It highlights how queerness is intersectional, crossing boundaries of gender and ethnicity and social status, and how gay rights should be inextricable from other political movements. Carl Pope's wall of letter-pressed posters are rooted in the African-American experience. Intersex artist Del Volcano's photographs defy gender as merely male or female. Canadian-born Attila Richard Lukash's large-scale paintings criticize mass incarceration and U.S. foreign policy. We've got artists from quite literally all over the world, and we also wanted to make sure that the exhibition represented as great a diversity as possible, and so it's one of those rare American exhibitions that is not a majority white male population. Zanele Muholi's stunning black and white photographs document queer culture in South Africa. Leonard Suryajaya's pictures in vibrant, saturated color tell the story of the complicated dynamic between identity, family, and a gay relationship. Emerging artists are featured alongside widely recognizable names, but the show also shines a light on works rarely or never seen. The quality of the exhibition is blue chip. These are uniformly great artists, not good artists, great artists. But because they don't conform to a certain vision of what, for example, gay art should look like, they've not gotten their due. Self-taught photographer Amos Bodicher's photographs of young male sex workers in Baltimore that look at the power dynamic between Hustler and John and the social ills those young men often face. 
Richard Hoffman, who died of AIDS at age 39. Massive neo-expressionist paintings that can appear abstract up close, but that feature forms and figures when viewed at a distance. Among some of the surprising works, never-before-seen photographs taken by Harvey Milk, the first gay elected official in the U.S. who for years ran a photo shop in San Francisco's Castro neighborhood. Loss, of course, features in the show. Milk was assassinated, Hoffman and many others shown died of AIDS, but the show is far from somber. It would be sort of silly to do a show about flux and fluidity that had only a singular emotive key, right? So we want the show to move you, um, to inspire you, to make you sad, to make you depressed. It's a series of arcs and highs, including quiet and contemplative work. The show's emotional arcs are possible in part because of its ambitious scope, sprawling throughout the four floors of Wrightwood 659's massive space. It is the largest queer art show ever mounted anywhere. It's powerful, it's moving, um, there's so much of it that it takes a good amount of time to really absorb and appreciate. And after appreciating the exhibition's 492 pieces, Curator Katz hopes visitors take with them something that speaks to a very new vision of sexual difference, one that builds not boundaries between people, but actually seeks to evaporate them in favor of our common humanity. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Nick Blumberg. About Face, Stonewall, Revolt, and New Queer Art open today and runs through July 20th. You can find more information on our website. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. The statue of a standing Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln Park is instantly recognizable to Chicagoans, even when it's in Mexico City, which is where a WTTW producer spotted an exact replica of the Chicago Monument. So how did Honest Abe wind up standing around south of the border? Yo no sé, but Jeffrey Bayer has the answer in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. Jeffrey, great to see you. Good to be here. Okay, so our first letter comes from in-house, our yeah. WTTW colleague Dan Projets. He says, greetings from Mexico City. Last night I was in Parque Lincoln and I saw this statue. Look familiar? The plaque said it was a gift from the United States. Did someone copy St. Gaudens Standing Lincoln from Chicago's very own Parque Lincoln? Well, that, that is uh, from our questioner, Dan Protest, and he's referencing the, the uncanny similarity between the sculpture that you just saw in Mexico City uh, with uh, the, the famous Standing Lincoln in Chicago's Lincoln Park. It's considered one of the most important works of certainly, probably at least, the greatest American sculptor of the 19th century, Augustus St. Gaudens. Um, here he shows Lincoln deep in thought as he rises to give a speech. This was unveiled in 1887, and it deeply influenced other artists' depictions of the slain president. So Dan Protest, the producer, and I have um, featured this, this standing Lincoln statue in any number of our shows. You can imagine how surprised Dan was to see it uh, in Mexico City. All right, so to his question, how did it end up in Mexico City? Well, a duplicate of a it. A duplicate, yes. You, you, you can thank President Lyndon Johnson uh, for that. Um, uh, he commissioned the work in 1964 as sort of a goodwill gesture, a gift to the people of Mexico to kind of reinvigorate U.S.-Mexican relations. And in researching this, look at this, we found out that there are four more duplicates. One of them is in, in London, right in front of Parliament. One of them is in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Then there's one at a cemetery in Los Angeles. And there's even one at St. Gaudens Home and Studio in New Hampshire, which is now a National Historic Site. Okay, so how does this all work? Does someone um, give uh, give the country the rights to the original to, yeah. just, to just copy? Yeah, who has the rights? Right. So uh, that's exactly what I wondered. So um, I, I consulted a noted St. Gaudens expert. Her name is Thayer Tolles. She's a, a curator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. And she told me that after Augustus St. Gaudens died, his wife, Augusta, they were known as Gus and Gussie. How about that? Really? Yeah. Um, so Augusta, who you see here, controlled the rights to duplicate works that St. Gaudens had copyrighted. And she made miniature reproductions and sold uh, them uh, to make money to live on of many of St. Gaudens' famous works, but the standing Lincoln was never copyrighted. 
It belonged to the Lincoln Park Commission, and when Gussie asked to make copies, they voted unanimously to, quote, never permit any replicas to be made. Um, Augusta then appealed to none other than President Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln himself, to intervene, and the Parks Commission uh, did eventually grant permission to her uh, to, quote, aid the widow. And they also seem to have granted permission to uh, have plaster molds made um, from the sculpture so that that London, the first one, the London reproduction could be made in 1920. Um, full-sized reproduction. Uh, today the work uh, is in public domain and there's a plaster cast of it which is stored at the St. Gaudens historic site. And just to clarify, the Lincoln Park one is the original? The Lincoln Park one is the, absolutely the original. Okay, so besides the standing Lincoln, are there other uh, works of St. Gaudens in Chicago? Yeah, there are many. Um, we're showing you two of them right here, uh, both in Grant Park, uh, a sculpture of Civil War General John A. Logan, um, and another Lincoln, actually. This is the seated Lincoln in Grant Park. St. Gaudens uh, was also the sculpture uh, advisor for the World's Fair, the Great World's Fair of 1893, for the all star cast of artists that were assembled to come here to Chicago. Um, he called the World's Fair of 1893 the greatest meeting of artists since the 15th century. Uh, and our questioner, Dan Protest, the producer, and I took a deep dive into St. Gaudens in the PBS primetime program, 10 Monuments That Changed America. Uh, we featured St. Gaudens mind-boggling memorial to the Massachusetts 54th, an African-American regiment that fought in the Civil War. And actually that show uh, is going to be rebroadcast on WTTW on July 5th. I will make sure to watch it or to record it. Set All your right. DVR. I will do that. Okay, let's get to our next letter. It's from John Rohr in Darien. He says, when I was a child, I was awed by my first visit to the Novelty Golf Course in Lincolnwood. <laughs> I recently met a relative from that neighborhood and was astonished to hear that it not only is still there, but virtually unchanged from the 1950s. Tell me about the history and the owners of this attraction. Well, I love that place. I don't know if awe is the right word. <laughs> for it. Um, uh, the family owned and operated Novelty Golf uh, has been at uh, the, the intersection of Lincoln Avenue and Devon, that's on Chicago's northwest side, for about 70 years. Um, as our viewers said, they've stayed uh, true to the old-fashioned miniature golf style with foot pedal operated <laughs> moving obstacles and quirky <laughs> fiberglass figures guarding each hole. We talked to Craig Klatsko, who was part of the third of four generations of the Klatsko family to own and operate the course. He said his grandparents, Rose and Louis Klatsko, and their son Buddy, bought an existing but subpar mini golf course at Devon and Lincoln in 1964 and made a bunch of improvements. They added batting cages, they added a game room, and this place, we all know it on the northwest side, the Bunny Absolutely. Hutch hot dog stand. Um, the Klatsko family also owned Hollywood Kitty Land, which was a small amusement park near Devon and McCormick. Wow, and I, I've eaten at the Bunny Hutch and I've taken swings at the batting cages there. there. All go. right, so the landscaping on that course uh, looks uh, a little different than a standard golf yeah, course. Yeah, check this out. Um, it's pretty unusual. The two courses, there's two courses at Novelty Golf, they have two courses, um, are separated by plantings of flower beds and even fruits and vegetables. And Klatsko said that one visitor actually started picking some hmm. of the produce while she was playing golf there. Wow, and I understand that uh, WTTW helped reunite a chicken couple for Novelty Golf. Can you please tell me what <laughs> this is so referring to? That's right. Back in 1992, uh, Novelty Golf was featured on the iconic WTTW program, Wild Chicago. And here it is. And in the course of that program, uh, Craig's brother, Richard Klatsko, mentioned that one pair uh, of... Uh, one of a pair of eight-foot-tall chickens had gone missing from the course, <laughs> and he begged the public for its return. Um, after the episode aired, he got a call from a viewer <laughs> who said they spotted the chicken while riding the L. Klatsko says he found the free-range chicken in a Ravenswood backyard. The owner claimed to know nothing about where this big chicken in her backyard came from, um, but it still had a property of novelty golf uh, uh, paint, painted on the foot of the chicken, so Craig was able to. The chicken wasn't riding alone, was it? Uh, no. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, do we know anything about where mini golf came from? We do. Um, uh, it can trace its origins back to the famous St. Andrews uh, Golf Course the, in Scotland. There was a putting only course at St. Andrews created for women uh, because back then taking a full swing with a golf club was uh, considered unladylike. Um, and early mini golf courses. 
um, like this one were just miniature versions of regular golf <laughs> courses. But in, in 1929, uh, a Georgia man, Garnet Carter, built a goofy mini golf course with wacky obstacles uh, to entertain guests at his tourist trap, which people have probably heard of, Lookout Mountain in Georgia. So all those young couples on their first dates have that <laughs> course to thank, that's basically. That's right. Just took off from there. Yep, that's right. And uh, uh, by the way, Novelty Golf uh, is open for the season um, for anyone who's looking for some Memorial Day putting. Okay, I'll see you there. Uh, let's do it. All right, thank you, Jeffrey. <laughs> sure thing. And you can watch the Wild Chicago segment and find out more about Standing Lincoln and other stories on our website. And while you're there, don't forget to tap in your questions about Chicago to Jeffrey Bayer. And back to wrap things up right after this. Ask Jeffrey is made possible in part by BMO Harris Bank. <laughs> what? Oh no, I have suspicious activity on my debit card. Now what? You know. Ah! Oh, sorry. With BMO Harris, you can just freeze your card right from your phone. Wow, really? Yeah. Ah! You can unfreeze it too. Uh, who's? How many roommates do you have? That feeling you get when a bank puts security at your fingertips. That's the BMO effect. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Join us tomorrow night live at 7. Illinois' DCFS acting director joins us to discuss the state of the department and plans for its future. And the local filmmaker behind the Chicago-based Netflix series, Easy. And we leave you tonight with a glimpse of some of the 40 life-size animal sculptures created from millions of color colorful Lego bricks. The menagerie of animals can be seen at Brookfield Zoo through September 29th. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.